So I hope you have been having a great time at Hack the Capital, and now we have a special treat for you, which she's so amazing, we had to pre-record it because her awesomeness in person would have blown your minds. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I lied, I wasn't gonna do your intro, but Jen, I think I just did your intro. Thanks, man. Really uh, excited to be here. Um, I am Jen Easterly, director of CISA. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but there's always next year, but um, glad to be here. We're gonna hold you to that. Next year, <laughs> you heard it. Where's the scheduler? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in, baby. Um, so this is our fifth one. And uh, I mean, what we're trying to do here is really facilitate the fact that critical infrastructure is something that's so key to society. And yet almost nobody understands anything about it. So let's start with the easy softball. Yes. What yes. does CISA do with critical infrastructure? Yes. So uh, let's step back a sec. CISA, what is CISA all about? Um, so we were created about three plus years ago now, November of 2018, by our good mutual friend, uh, Chris Krebs, who founded it. And it was really a brilliant vision on the part of Congress, which is why I was so excited to be at Hack the Capitol, because we owe a lot to the vision and the uh, energy and the enthusiasm uh, and the willingness of Congress to actually build the newest agency in the federal government, uh, which was really designed to be America's cyber defense agency. So our mission is to lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk to the physical and the digital infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour of every day. And I think that's key. You know, we throw around words like critical infrastructure, but this is really how we get gas at the pump, how we get food at the grocery store, how we get money from the ATM. It's the power, it's the water, it's the metro we take to work, it's how we communicate. It's essentially, Bryce, in the networks and the data and the systems that underpin our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And it's why I was so attracted to coming back from the private sector to this mission because given that everything rides on a technology backbone these days, it's incredibly important to get this mission right, to be able to protect and defend that critical infrastructure that Americans rely on. So critical infrastructure is critical. Yeah. Security is in the agency's name twice, twice. so we don't forget we about it. it. We love it, we love it, yeah. And the agency is young. I think a lot of people forget how young the agency is the resourcing from that because it's Congress that sets and authorizes the funding which enables you to do what you're doing. Yep. So what do you do? So as I said, we, we were built to be America's cyber defense agency, but we do more than that. Our cybersecurity division is our largest division, uh, but we have an emergency communications division that's responsible for secure interoperable emergency communications, like think about 911 first responders. Uh, we have an infrastructure security division, which does a physical security mission, uh, which really grew out of 9-11 when the focus was on terrorism and the physical threat to structures. But as you think about structures becoming more and more smart buildings, right, there's going to there's gonna be a very convergent aspect to this. And that's why uh, positioning the agency as America's cyber defense agency, I think the Congress had a real prescient vision of that because we're gonna to have to be able to defend all of our infrastructure from all sorts of, threat, all sorts of threats. And so we do uh, cyber, we do physical, we do emergency comms, uh, we do stakeholder engagement, which is incredibly important. We do national risk management, which is essentially assessment of the most important risks that we're dealing with, whether that's uh, supply chain risks or uh, things with telecommunications or pipeline security or election security or misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. Uh, and then we have a growing field force that I'm actually super excited about. We've got about 600 folks that are in uh, all across America in all the states and regions and we are growing that uh, team by hundreds. And so those are protective security advisors, there's cybersecurity advisors, there's chemical security advisors, there are emergency communications in the area that's growing the most, it won't surprise you, are our cybersecurity advisors and our cybersecurity state coordinators. So building that field force, because they can work with our state and local colleagues and all of our frontline critical infrastructure owners and operators to help make sure that they've got the guidance, the tools, the resources, and importantly, 
because some of these critical infrastructure are not like your big public companies, as you well know. Some of them have very little resourcing. Think about some of the hospitals that we've seen hit by ransomware. Think about some of the schools. Think about some of the water utilities that don't have a ton of security systems. And so we are out there to help them understand what they need to do to secure their networks and their systems, and also, in many cases, to provide no-cost resources, which is fantastic to be able to give them an ability to do assessments, whether that's vulnerability assessments, resilience assessments, phishing assessments. And so that direct touch uh, to our uh, partners and stakeholders in the field is so important, and that's why we're growing part of that mission. You know, it's interesting. I spent the vast majority of my career before I went to the private sector in intelligence, in the Army, as you were my fellow West Point grad, right? Uh, in counterterrorism, in uh, policy, uh, and you know, frankly, that's a place where the federal government has monopoly power. But in cybersecurity, the federal government is just a partner, just a co-equal partner with state and local colleagues and with the private sector. And that's why it's just so awesome to be part of this mission, because every day is about developing trusted relationships with those stakeholders in the field to make sure that we can build together for the collective cyber defense of the nation. And it really is a privilege to have this job because you know, life is a contact sport. And so developing those trusted partners and relationships, really building off of what Chris built as the founder of CISA, um, I just, every day is a, is a journey of discovery and, and a huge amount of fun. So Chris and I are going to do the uh, closing notes in person oh, okay. at Hack the Capitol, uh -oh. and it's going to be codenamed TLP Red Pants. <laughs> if you've seen our, our Red Pants bit oh, that we I've do. I've seen the Red Pants. Yep. I had to, you know, I mean, Chris is a hard act to follow, so I had to like come up with my own style, which wasn't difficult. But no, yeah. no, you, you had the, the Dragon Pants, right? <laughs> I had the Dragon Pants, yep, exactly. Yep. So exactly. We, we, we did coin TLP Dragon Pants on the back channel. I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> I did, I did. I liked it a lot. Uh, one of the other uh, talks we have at Hack the Capital is uh, with uh, Jake Brodsky and Molly Breen, and they're going to be talking about a day in the life of a um, small water utility, right? Because as you noted, it's not the, the ones that have everything that need the help. It's the have-nots who don't, right? They don't have the cyber resources. They're there doing what they can to provide clean, safe water from a mechanical perspective. And the increasing interconnected nature of all of these things are just a, oh, that's a thing now, right? I have to apply a software patch, not just do my traditional preventative maintenance that I do on cycle. Um, I also really like, because the, the initiative with putting folks in the field, that's what, about a year and a half old? Yeah, I mean, we had a couple folks to begin with, but we stood up when we became CISA and under this initiative that Chris started, CISA 2020, we did a massive reorganization. And so some folks wondered, well, what happened to US CERT? What happened to ICS CERT? What happened to the NKIC? Well, nothing. It all just became part of uh, CISA. And so uh, ICS CERT, US CERT, NKIC became part of the cybersecurity division. And then we grew and we moved out uh, the security advisors into what's called the Integrated Operations Division, and that's the field force. But you know what is so important is that it's not these little fiefdoms all over. We are really building one CISA because that connectivity across mission divisions at headquarters and across the field and even across our mission enabling offices like our amazing CIO and um, the folks that actually make the engine run, you know, having been a staff officer in the Army, I have a great appreciation for all of the backroom work that takes to drive mission. And so we're really working hard to create that magic of connectivity. And part of this is creating a culture which really uh, defines what we expect from each other and what we aspire to be as, you know, the newest federal agency in the U.S. government and having had the experience at West Point, having been in the Army for 22 years, I don't think you can discount the importance of culture. So I've actually spent a huge amount of the, the last nine months working with my team to co-create core values and core principles that will, I hope, stand us in good stead over the next five years, 10 years. And um, it won't surprise you that a lot of it is about creating trust, collaboration, empowerment, innovation, inclusion, and really about creating an environment of resilience. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's incredibly important as we 
continue to take CISA into the next several decades. And that's, that's what I like about the, the field operative strategy because it takes CISA from being a, an ivory tower federal agency dictating from Washington with paper down into the trenches everywhere, building that trust, building those relationships. Um, and because that's so key because trust takes knowing who you're working with and building that up. And it is done by drops and as they say, lost in buckets. So what other initiatives is CISA going to be pushing to support that? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and what you said just resonates with me so much because you know, you're in the army, I, I was in the army, and you know that um, the action happens in the field, right? There's a huge important role for what happens at headquarters, but oftentimes where you're out there on the frontier, alone, unafraid, as we used to say, um, those relationships are incredibly important when the rubber meets the road. So that's a little bit of what's in the back of my mind as we build out those capabilities. But the other thing that I'm really proud of, Bryson, is what we set up based on the fantastic authorities that we were given with the 2021 NDAA. Um, and it was called the JCPO, and this came out of uh, some awesome ideas from the Solarium Commission. Uh, and so this idea was you would have a joint cyber planning office that would bring together the federal government and the private sector to plan together, to exercise together, and then to implement joint cyber defense uh, planning. And was actually talking with the great uh, representative Jim Langevin, uh, who I know is um, a superhero to this community. And it was right after I got confirmed and he, he talked about, well, um, really using that platform uh, to start building, to bringing the community together on ransomware. This was back in uh, July of, of last year after Colonial Pipeline and JBS Foods and Kaseya Software. And so what I ended up doing was launching it at Black Hat last year. And I didn't like the name JICPO because it just didn't sound very good. Um, and so I'm a big fan of 80s rock music, and yes, exactly. And so uh, I went for JCDC. I tried to call it the Advanced Cyber Defense Collaborative. The lawyers would not let me, so we ended up with JCDC. Um, but what we're trying to achieve there are a couple things that I think are really important. First of all, the JCDC is the only entity in legislation that brings together the full force of the federal cyber ecosystem which is something that I was really trying to solve for, having been at Morgan Stanley and seeing all these different agencies reaching out to you and a real lack of coherence. And so it brings together CISA and FBI and NSA and Cyber Command and ODNI and DOJ and the Secret Service and the Office of the National Cyber Director as a one-stop shop platform for how industry can reach in and deal with the federal government on matters of cyber defense, right? That's our North Star. We don't do anything but cyber defense. We don't do foreign intelligence. We don't do investigation or pursuit. Very important capabilities, but our North Star is cyber defense. And, and so we're the front door for industry on matters of cyber defense. And by law, we can serve as that platform. The other thing that the JCDC does is it's about being proactive, right? We all know when bad things happen, we do heroics to respond, right? We work. 36 hours straight, and we get the job done, we're exhausted at the end of it, um, but we make it happen because we're mission people and we're operators, but that's not the way it should be. We have to be able to be proactive, to plan together, to work together, to understand the threat environment. And so we are working with our private sector partners to develop plans that will allow us to understand how we need to operate uh, in, uh, in the event of a major cyber incident. And so we have been exercising uh, with our partners since uh, February or so in, as, we're, as we were looking at the potential invasion of Ukraine by Russia. We actually built a plan with our JCDC partners, um, took four hours to exercise that plan, and then came together in an operational collaboration channel, essentially a Slack channel, uh, where we've been sharing information in real time with the private sector uh, and um, enriching that information and providing feedback and responsiveness. So it's not like the black box that government gets the wrap, right, where your information comes in and it never goes out. On this platform, we've been looking to bring together pieces of what the private sector knows, what we know, 
uh, putting those dots together and then working together to drive down risk to the nation at scale. And I think what I have seen over the past several months, we worked on Log4j with the same group and then uh, with Ukraine, working both with our technology partners, we call them the JCDC Alliance, as well as the big banks and the big energy companies. I have seen um, a growth of trust because at the end of the day, if we are responsive, if we are transparent, uh, if we say what we do know and what we don't know, if we work with our great IC colleagues to help declassify as much as possible, if we share products ahead of time so they can be enriched uh, by our partners, as we've done over the past several weeks, if we make information then as widely available as possible, I think that helps to build the trust that, you're right, is so foundational to CIS's mission and to our success as America's cyber defense agency. And you know, as you pointed out, it's, it's hard to build and easy to lose. And I think one of the keys to trust is transparency. So we work really hard to make sure that we call it like we see it. Um, mm -hmm. When we have information, we push it out. Um, and we be as forthright as possible um, in everything we know and we're trying to do. And we do it, um, which I think is really important, we, we do it with, with a sense of humility. Um, because certainly at the end of the day, the government doesn't have all the answers, the private sector doesn't have all the answers. And what I have the privilege of having with this as the newest federal government agency is like, you know, we're new, man. We can make mistakes, and it's okay to make mistakes. You shouldn't be paralyzed by a fear of failure, and you should treat feedback as a gift. And so, you know, I'd say to everybody out there, like, take a look at our stuff. Come to our website. Read our advisories. Give me feedback. Give the team feedback, because everything that we're trying to do is to add value, right? If it's not actionable, if it's not timely, if it's not relevant, if it can't be used by a network defender, to increase the security and resilience of your network, then it's kind of a waste of time. So help us uh, build what the Congress envisioned uh, to be a real capability to add value so that we can, in fact, protect and defend the critical infrastructure that we all rely on every hour of every day. A perfect example of how fast everything is moving is I submitted these questions to your staff a week ago. <laughs> Since then, the question on JCDC has already been updated yeah. because as of S4, you announced how JCDC has been CISA struck yeah. for critical infrastructure. <laughs> I just made that up. I want to, I want to try. I like that. it. I like it. Cause I'm, my walkout music of choice is of course, Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck. Yep. Yeah. It's the best song. It, my friend. Um, yeah, I was super excited. First of all, like S4 was great, right? I was, I really enjoyed it down there. It's such a great crowd of folks who have that expertise. And when you think about like the most urgent risks to the nation, um, those against our industrial control systems, our operational technology, because threat actors are typically not going after those systems to um, ultimately just collect intelligence. They're looking at them for destructive and disruptive purposes. And so, so important that we be able to uh, leverage the expertise and the capabilities of that community. And so I was super excited to announce that we actually extended the, to the JCDC to JCDC ICS or JCDC ICE, uh, bringing in you know about 10 companies uh, to work with us. And I'm excited because the first thing we're going to do is leverage those companies along with pipeline asset owners and operators. Uh, you know, after Colonial Pipeline, we did a bunch of work under the auspices of a 100-day sprint from the National Security Council. And so now what we want to do is to be able to plan and exercise along with those pipeline companies and those ICS vendors uh, and operators so that we can bring together that community again because it's all about collective cyber defense. So I was really excited that S4 and Dale gave me an opportunity to make that announcement. I also am going to shamelessly make an announcement here for the other thing I said at S4, which is we're hiring a whole bunch of uh, tech uh, ICS experts. Um, we put out the uh, jobs announcements. We're also hiring a senior ICS uh, expert to work under our Office of uh, Technical Director that we're hiring under our new authorities, the Cyber Talent Management System, which allows us to be much more flexible and pay closer to market. So you may want to check it out. Bryson, um, if you're interested in joining the government once again. Uh, but it's a great opportunity. And under these new authorities, the cool thing is 
we're not looking for people to necessarily make a career. We're looking for people to come into the government who want to raise their hand and support and defend the Constitution of the United States and be part of protecting and defending America and maybe do it for two or three years. And then you go back, you serve in another part of the private sector where you're, again, part of that uh, collective cyber defense effort. So I don't look at this as competitive. I think what you're doing is just as important to our collective cyber defense as what we're doing at CISA. And it's why, at the end of the day, the partnerships and the events like Hack the Capital and the ICS Village. And uh, one of the things I'm excited about is our escape room that you're going to roll out at Hack the Capital. I'm going to try and come visit as well. And it just shows, right? It's the kind of stuff that I just, I love, right? I'm a puzzler and coming up with ways to use creativity and innovation um, to get people interested and excited and more knowledgeable on incredibly important topics like uh, protecting our industrial control system. So I couldn't be more excited about our partnership. If you have not gone to the escape room, there's still time at the conference to go to the escape room and sign up Do to it. join that. Do it. And if you join us at DEF CON, the full escape room exactly, will be there. Exactly, exactly. It's super all right. exciting. So closing us out are the final two big questions. All right. This is where we go a little off script. Okay. I'm with you, man. <laughs> I'm with you before you ask the question. <laughs> After the question, I'm not so sure. Okay. Uh -oh. If you could wave a magic wand, and note we have some very influential people in the attendance here. Yeah. Some of them can write appropriation bills, so wink, wink, right? Okay. If you could wave a magic wand, what is one thing independent of resources you would change in critical infrastructure? I mean, think about, um, I grew up in the 70s, right? When people were driving around and those station wagons with the wood, wood panels, panel, like, yep. right? Some of them had the seats where you're sort of like facing the wrong way. and Car seats? What are car yeah, seats? Yeah, exactly. No car <laughs> seats, no seat belts, our carpool mom smoking the cigarette. I mean, those were the days, right? But now we live in a world where seat belts in every single car, you know, the safety is something we take for granted. And you know, frankly, the basics around cyber hygiene, I, I would like to see that implemented across the nation, right? The basics around implementing multi-factor authentication. Everybody should use more than a password. That's my that's my new tagline, Bryson. You got to help me with it. I'm going to try and MFA? get. Well, it's going to be more than a password, like Boston, more than a okay. feeling, like okay. more than oh, a password. Oh, right. Right. You yeah. love it. Don't you love it? Um, so. I think the basic, having a baseline of, of cyber hygiene in the same way where there's a seatbelt in every car, um, MFA on every account, uh, software that's automatically updated. Um, you know, if you have MSA, you, MFA, you can go passwordless, right? And so it's, the, it's the, a technology ecosystem that is secure by design. So that's my like Harry Potter thingy, magic okay. wand thingy. So what do you, what do you, well, here, I'm going to ask you, no, what's no, your magic no, wand, we, man? We, in terms of time, I'll, Dude, I'll tell you after we're done recording. So. All right. Now we're going to look into our crystal Rubik's Cube. <laughs> okay. okay. You wave the magic wand. Now you have your non-internet okay. connected, okay. air gapped crystal Rubik's Cube. One good thing and one bad thing you predict in the next five years. Well, so you get to ask the question and I get to give the answer. So, so let me, in the, in the next five years, I hope that CISA achieves the promise, um, the vision that the Congress um, has for it. And I think we're on a fantastic path with the additional budget, the authorities, the amazing people that we're hiring here. Um, I think my, my goal is to leave CISA better than when I found it. And you know, Chris left it in a really good place. So that's a high bar. Um, and so you know, what that looks like in the next five years, I think is, um, more capability, more capacity, um, a highly diverse talent pipeline, um, a lot more entry-level folks. We're really reshaping more folks in the field. And so that's the good thing that's going to happen. And, and in all seriousness, the things that I worry about, and this is probably um, more than five years, you can look at the next 10 years. When you think back about the last 15 years, um, it's amazing when you think, so 2007, the year of the iPhone, the year of Twitter, the year of Facebook, the year of Hadoop, right? The year of Android, the year of Kindle, and that's just 15 years. Mm -hmm. You know, think of how much the world has changed. So, in the next 10 years, I firmly believe we are going to either win the battle for technology dominance, or we're going to lose it pretty badly. 
And so you think about quantum cryptography, you think about artificial intelligence, you think about biotech, um, you think about semiconductors, right? All of this, we are really in a race to see, are we gonna be able to make the investments, the technology investments that will keep us ahead as the world's biggest economy and you know, as the technology, as the superpower, but technology innovation is a huge part of that. Think about 5G. Like that door is kind of closed at the end of the day. So what are we doing ahead now to invest in 6G? So we don't find ourselves in 10 years really sorely behind the power curve. And you know, part of that at the end of the day is if we are able to lead on technology innovation, we and our like-minded nations, uh, I think that will make a big difference in terms of our overall national security, our economic prosperity, our public health and safety, because everything is networks, everything is connected, everything is vulnerable. And so our ability to use innovation to shape the technology ecosystem for good is really a matter of almost existential in many ways. And I think as building CISA to be the cyber defense agency that frankly the nation deserves, I think we can play a really um, critical role in leading on innovation. And so I'm you know, super excited about that as well. That's a hell of a crystal Rubik's cube. Yeah, there you go. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks, man. Great chat.